My clients were good, hardworking people. Initially, I was skeptical about representing them since I normally help people save their homes. But my clients, because their financial situation had changed, couldn't afford their home anymore and wanted help just turning it over to the bank. So why didn't they just simply give it back? It's never that simple. They'd been trying for over a year. Without an attorney, the bank just ignored them. My involvement got the bank to open the door. Then we were able to negotiate the details, draft the documents, and sign off on everything. Afterwards, my client told me that he felt that the weight of the world had been lifted off his shoulders. A few years ago, I represented Mohammed in his application for asylum. Mohammed was an Iraqi paramedic uh, during the height of the war in Iraq. He and his family were brought to the United States by and at the request of the U.S. Department of Justice to testify as a witness uh, in a brutal crime involving an American soldier and a young Iraqi girl. Mohammed spoke no English, he'd never been to the United States before, and he knew the consequences of being perceived as collaborating with the American government. But in the interests of justice, he agreed to testify. And back home, he was branded as a traitor. If Mohammed and his wife and his two young children had returned to a war-torn Iraq where translators and other civilians who assisted or the U.S. government were being routinely being murdered and tortured, he likely would not have survived. Securing asylum for Mohammed and his family was one of the most rewarding and emotional experiences of my life. Mohammed had faced so many battles and difficult circumstances. His life in Iraq was centered around providing uh, the sick and wounded victims of war with help and providing for his wife and two kids in a country wracked by conflict and violence. And even after he, we won his right to asylum, his life continued to be very difficult. He had to find a job to support his family without the ability to speak English or license to practice medicine. Uh, his children had to attend public school and had to learn and make friends and build a life in a language that they didn't speak. Like so many new immigrants to this country, Mohammed and his family struggled really hard to start building a new life, but at least they were safe. And I was and continue to be honored and fortunate to have had the opportunity to help Mohammed and his family secure a basic measure of safety. Many people don't understand what we mean when we speak of the access to justice problem. Quite simply, it means that 80% of our citizens cannot afford to pay for the legal services they need. As a result, this third branch of government is not serving the people whom it was constitutionally designed to protect. By performing pro bono legal work, we are making a small dent in this enormous societal problem. Taking an individual pro bono case does not make the issue go away but it does immeasurably impact the life of the person we represent. In my experience, performing that service feels better than any fees that we're normally accustomed to receiving. Pro bono has been an important part of my practice since I began practicing in 1992. I have handled mortgage foreclosures and personal injury defense, housing, race and sex discrimination cases, breach of contract and consumer protection cases on a pro bono basis. I saw very early on that people are victimized by their inability to pay for legal counsel, especially when they are unaware of their legal rights. It is rewarding to see how my help has made a real difference in their lives. Throughout my career, I have found ways to budget my time to take on pro bono cases. When I see the difference it makes, the extra time I spend is more than worth it. 20 years ago, I was appointed to represent a 10-year-old girl in a very contentious custody case that was being covered by local media. She was a very nice little girl in a, in a very unhappy situation. I worked hard to get her to feel comfortable enough with me to be open and honest. We talked frequently. She called me on weekends when she was struggling with visitation and whenever she was confused or worried about her case. I was her lawyer and she knew I was fighting for her. Her case lasted for six years. I recently had lunch with her. Now she's in her early 30s happily married with a graduate degree and a job she really likes. She had a great time talking about life, her life today, not her past. She was chatty, engaging, and laughed a lot. That lunch made me so happy, it will carry me through tough days and tough cases. That's what pro bono can do, carry you through the tough times at work. Yes, it is time to retire, but first, Find something that interests you, my wife replied. Good advice, leading me to pro bono. 
I could still practice law, plus I had a sense of the goodness of the work, relieving a debt problem, caring for an aged parent, correcting a property interest, and so many other issues. One becomes filled with a sense of well-being, personal pride, and respect for the importance of law to our society. As my first pro bono client shared her story with me, she said, the first time I saw him, he pointed a gun at me. The next time I saw him, I witnessed him murder someone outside the bar where I worked. In the two months after I saw him commit murder, he kidnapped me and raped me on three different occasions. My pro bono client came to the United States seeking refuge, but quickly found herself and her daughter detained in a detention facility in southern Texas. Thanks to the help of volunteer attorneys, she and her child were able to pass through the initial asylum screening process and bond out of detention. Upon release, they were placed in removal or deportation proceedings to seek asylum in an adversarial setting. Despite my client being a single mother with no criminal history, the government appealed the bond. I took over her case to handle the bond appeal and present her asylum case in immigration court. We won both cases. Now my client and her child live safely in the United States. The possibility that she would still be in this country without the aid of legal representation is slim to none. While not monetary in nature, there is a reward for pro bono work and knowing you may save a life or drastically improve a person's circumstances. Pro bono cases can seem to be some of the more difficult cases to take. The circumstances leading to a person's inability to afford legal representation make their lives challenging enough but add to those circumstances a significant legal obstacle and they can reach a breaking point of despair. Many times, those circumstances make working for the client difficult logistically and emotionally. I've made several trips as a volunteer attorney to the detention facilities that hold mothers and their children, most recently this past September. Seeing a baby in what amounts to a jail setting is disturbing, and working with mothers who share stories of rape, domestic violence, murdered family members, and threats on their lives is an overwhelming and surreal experience. However, I find my law license has never been put to better use than when helping these clients. I have benefited significantly personally and professionally in doing pro bono work with these women and children seeking asylum. As a result of volunteering in the detention facilities, I met some of the best attorneys in my field of practice. I now have direct access to them when I need mentorship or guidance. On the first trip, I roomed with a stranger with whom I have since started a nonprofit, VITA, the Volunteer Immigrant Defense Advocates, that provides legal services to underserved areas of Eastern Tennessee. While I traveled across the country to perform some of my pro bono work, you can find many pro bono opportunities without leaving Chicago. Pro bono work is the best thing I did for my career, and it can be for you too.